Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Alliance of the Philippine Aromatherapist live cast. And for today, August 22, 2021, we're going to be having Dr. Augustine Doronila to talk about how cinnamon changed the Philippines. So, Dr. Doronila is a DOST Balik scientist and a Melbourne based biogeochemist whose expertise lies in the ecological restoration of ecosystems destroyed by mining. He first came in 2009 to assist Filipino scientists in advancing world class research on metallophytes, plants that eat metals. Together with local scientists, they have to date published more than 20 international papers on their groundbreaking research. Likewise, Dr. Doronila has held lectures in various educational institutions like Ateneo de Manila University, De La Salle University, UST, UP de Liman, UPLB, Xavier. CDO, UP Baguio, DLS Lipa, and SLSU, among others. Further, Dr. Doronila is a science advisor to Plantsville Health and has been an enthusiastic sounding board for various aspects related to chemistry and botany. So everybody, please welcome Dr. Yob Doronila. So th this is the kind of things I've been working with. And because of that, I've had a chance to visit the Philippines and collaborate in so many ways with our wonderful Filipino scientists. So I'll just turn on my share screen and we can start the, the talk. Can you see that? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so you know, the, the title, you know, it's, it's got three layers if you like. So I just want to show you You know, when, when I was contacted by Miss uh, November uh, about helping, you know, the, unpack a bit about, you know, what is, those, what is cinnamon, if you like, the Philippines. It also led me to a discovery of some remarkable uh, things. And, you know, I, I thought it's very appropriate that this year is the 500, the sesquicentenary of the Philippine contact with Europe, if you like. So... That's why I titled my talk this uh, Pamana, the story of a lost botanical pa paradise. And, and I just want to, hopefully you will discover that if it wasn't for cinnamon, the Philippines would not be what it is today. And, uh, you know, how we, we can make the best of also this, this profound heritage, you know, world heritage to, to, to really propel us into something of a different uh, journey. So I just want to point out there's three pictures in, in that uh, introductory slide. The one on the left is one of the first uh, illustrations of Philippine cinnamon. And this is painted by one of our most illustrious painters, you know, of the generation of Juan Luna. And the, the second is a, is a picture of a uh, cinnamon that uh, Miss November shared with me. And one, and the one on the right is a young... Uh, Kaninga that's growing in the cemetery of the Holy Spirit College in Mendiola, Manila. And I was able to visit it and, and see how luxuriant it is. And this was two years ago before lockdown. Okay. So just uh, put things in, in context. Well, cinnamon has been a, a very important plant, if you like, in, in the history of civilization. So a lot has been written about it right from the very beginning when people started building cities, if you like. And cinnamon is one of the earliest known spices known to humankind. So with the exchanges between uh, the, the fertile the civilizations, the Fertile Crescent, and eventually, you know, the great Egyptian civilizations, the Chinese and the Europeans. But The, our first known documentation of the use of cinnamon was by the Chinese, where they said that they used it. So this was already nearly 5,000 years ago. And that is the Chinese cinnamon, I think uh, we all understand. And then the Egyptians really used it a lot for uh, embalming their mummies. So I think it's obvious. I think we all know what cin cinnamon smells like. It's really mahamot or mabango. And in the Old Testament, it is mentioned as an ingredient in anointing oil. So it, it had some very important religious and cultural values. So during the, uh, if you like, the, the most uh, important uh, pandemic that's, that we've known as humanity, the Black Death, which literally decimated Europe. So, you know, 
two thirds of Europe was uh, wiped out, if you like, by the Black Death in the 14th century. And, and so the people in Europe uh, felt, well, you know, what, what are the things we can do to, uh, to live with such a situation? And so spices from the East were an option. It, it, people thought, well, they, this is one way of protecting themselves from uh, the, getting sick and dying from the plague. So they, this is why they had this hunger for, you know, spices like cloves and cinnamon and fennel. And this was, I mean, the, let's, let's just say they used it because they felt that this is one way of protecting them. But, uh, you know, that, that's, that's just a cultural understanding. So, you know, as you can see, uh, this had a very deep historical significance also in, in making people, well, see what can they do in, in these uh, pandemics. But it was also, cinnamon was used a lot for meat preservation. So th that picture there is just to show you some of the things that, that in the Wellcome collection, it's a, it's a museum in London. Uh, Wellcome is one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies or one of the oldest ones too. And you can see this cinnamon there, there's uh, a eucalyptus nut, some cloves, lemons, and, and there's uh, rosemary and thyme in the back. And uh, I'm not quite sure what's in the bottle, but it's, it's an oil of some sort, obviously. But let's go a bit forward. So, you know, after the, uh, you know, the, the, the tragedy of the bubonic plague pandemics, if you like, if you like, the Europeans felt, well, we've got to do something. And so, the, if you like, the, the, the time of the, the desire to discover what else is in the uh, unknown world was the real push in which Europeans started navigating the globes. And you can think, well, they sent out one or two or three small ships and they, they traveled all these uh, vast oceans to, to try to discover the unknown. And that opened up a whole chapter in humanity, if you like. So, it, it, so really what, what was a very important driver of exploration was the desire to find the sources of spices. And they did it because essentially the spices came to Europe uh, through the Arab brokers and they, they charged a fortune. So the, the, the Europeans, well, especially the, the powers at that time, Portugal and Spain, you know, the, the royalty then, they said, well, let's, let's fund our best explorers to, to look for it. So in came Christopher Columbus and he said, oh, I'll, I'll go find some. And... Uh, so that was already the, the, the start of the great uh, exploration. But we know that, well, Columbus was supposed to go to the east, but uh, the moment he left Europe, he caught the, the trade winds were such that it didn't allow him to go down Africa. It pushed him to the west. And uh, so he went to uh, you know, the, the islands of the Caribbean. And this is what happened okay, when he went to the Americas, he, he was very excited. He brought some spices back and he thought it was cinnamon. But then uh, when he brought it back, the people back home in, in uh, Portugal said, well, it smells nice. It smells like cinnamon, but it doesn't taste very nice. So that was, that was, the, <laughs> that was the first uh, lack of success in, the in looking for a new source of, of these spices. So this brings us next to the next great Portuguese explorer, Vasco da Gama. And Vasco was able to make that voyage uh, properly. He, he was able to, uh, he was, he, he was a, a great sailor who knew how to navigate around the coast uh, of Africa. And then he was able to go down to the southernmost tip of Africa. And once again, it's there to go to look for spices because they really wanted to, uh, cut the stranglehold of the Arab traders. So he arrived on, on the west coast of India, which was the heart of the spice trade, because there was a lot of trade from India and, uh, and the Arabs. But then towards the end of uh, uh, the 1500s, the Portuguese even pushed down to, to Ceylon, to Sri Lanka today. And there they found uh, a very, uh, well, it, the most aromatic uh, cinnamon that we have that we use nowadays. So this is what he did. So he traveled from Lisbon to the Cape 
and then to Calcutta. But then you see that little island there of Sri Lanka. That's that's you know, eventually the, the Portuguese were able to do that, and and they did it in a very violent way. They essentially overthrew the uh, Sri Lankan uh, kingdoms and uh, just took over it. But then it started a trade war between the Dutch, who eventually threw out the Portuguese, and the Dutch cornered the cinnamon trade. So this brings us to us, to, to the Philippines. So we all know who Ferdinand Magellan is. So uh, th this is just the image from the, the, the Philippine sesquicentenary uh, website of the circumnavigation. So when Magellan crossed the Pacific and he went to uh, the tip of Homohon there, but uh, I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. But Essentially, when he, he died in Mactan, the, the, the journey continued. He, they burnt one of their ships, so they ended up with two. So they were able to chart furthermore and eventually leave Philippine waters to go to the Spice Islands, which were, if you like, a Portuguese colony. So th this is, you know, when you think this is a remarkable feat of humanity that someone can go around the world in, in those terms with 18 people left with you know they don't have gps's and all these things and uh, this and they, they were quite remarkable sailors but essentially well they say it's magellan's voyage but magellan only made it halfway so the, the voyage of his team so i just want to point out uh, well what happened to the, the knowledge that came from that voyage so one of the uh, members of that expedition was this the, the Italian, uh, this Venetian uh, archivist called Antonio Pigafetta. So he lives just outside Venice. I've actually visited the town that he grew up in and everyone knows Pigafetta, but they didn't realize he went to the Philippines. So he was really the first tourist. <laughs> so they translated his uh, journals about a hundred years ago. So th this, this is an Italian and English version. So that's the page which is important to us. So this is what uh, comes to mind, which is important in terms of why the Spaniards came to the Philippines. So he says here, I'll just read that account. He said, while under sail, we bartered two large knives, which we had taken from the governor of Pulaon which is near Butuan, for 17 pounds of cinnamon. The cinnamon tree grows to a height of three or four cubits, so that's about five feet, and its stems are as thick as the fingers of the hand. It has about three or small or four small branches, and its leaves resemble those of the laurel because they're the same family anyway. Its bark is the cinnamon. So the cinnamon is that aromatic scent that we all know and the, he, from uh, what the... Uh, the, the, the people there, the, the locals said, they gathered it twice a year. And the wood and the leaves are strong as the cinnamon when they are green. And the local people called it the kayumana. So kayumana means, kayu means wood, and mana means sweet, hence sweet wood. So it filled all the characteristics, and they were very excited. So what happened then is when they left Philippine waters, they went to the Moluccus uh, and what they did is they, they were able to actually collect a whole lot of spices from there. They filled up the ship. And they, well, they filled up two ships, but they put it in one ship. One of the ships was eventually impounded by the Portuguese as, as they were just about to arrive into Spain. But the Victoria managed to escape. So the, the, the one lone ship that arrived out of the five was full of spices. But the incredible thing is, the amount of spices that was loaded up in that ship, I mean, remember, 15, 17 pounds from the Philippines, but the 26 tons was from uh, the, the Moluccus. And the value of those spices was enough to pay for the whole expense of that whole uh, expedition. And so it obviously shows that was really worth a lot of money. So what, so what, what happened then is, you know, when uh, the first, a uh, trip to colonize the Philippines happened. We know Miguel de Legaspi he arrived here 50 years ago. The first thing he wanted to do was to get uh, cinnamon. See, so he took up a load of cinnamon from the Sultan of Butuan and he immediately sent it to the first ship 
back to Mexico. And they were all very excited about it. But he also sent one of his captains to Zamboanga because they heard that there was so much cinnamon there. So Mateo Sanz unfortunately died, but they came back with a whole load of cinnamon. So Legaspe shipped all that uh, by the galleon. So this was the start of the first galleon trade there. So I, I just dug up this image from the web. And, and so this really opened up the first transatlantic trade of cinnamon. But the interesting thing is most of the cinnamon that there was then trans, you know, traded over the 250, 300 years of the galleon trade didn't come from the Philippines. It was traded by the Portuguese to the Spaniards and then sent back. So they, so they were able to, if you like, uh, flood the market or, or reduce the impact of the Spaniards by doing that. So they made double money from the Spaniards. But the Spaniards were very excited. They said they want to break into the market. So the second governor of uh, the Philippines at that time said, well, let, let's try to do something about it. So he sent uh, this amount, of, uh, this 8,000 pounds of cinnamon to, the, uh, to the, ro how, the royalty house and also three flasks of cinnamon water for the Queen of Austria, just to show them that there was so much uh, cinnamon. And as you can see there, this is there was this interesting uh, uh, piece of information there that you know it really was worth a lot of money. So it literally was this equivalent of gold dust that came from the cinnamon trade. But it was it was very I mean, the Dutch were very clever. They they managed to infiltrate the the Spanish market by by selling it to the Philippines and off to Mexico. And uh, and just as an aside, one interesting thing is, you know, it's it's. It's very exciting to think that when the first batch of cinnamon that came from the Philippines to uh, Mexico happened, one of the things that, if you like, made an impact on, on Mexican cuisine was cinnamon. You, you just think chocolate, the tablea, they mix with cinnamon, and the Mexicans really started drinking uh, chocolate drink with Philippine uh, cinnamon, but then that was obviously substituted by the Portuguese product. But you know, th this is uh, something that's also worth exploring. But then, you know, cinnamon really was worth a lot of money. An Englishman in 1761 decided that he'd like to try to develop uh, the, the cultivation of cinnamon in the Philippines because also. Uh, Ceylon or Sri Lanka at the time was very successful in cultivating cinnamon and which they, they were selling at the, in a more standardized and regular manner to the European market. So Nicholas Nichols uh, was given approval by the royalty house to cultivate cinnamon. So he went to Mindanao, he, he took some cuttings. And it was interesting because he, they, he understood that the leaves and the bark of the cinnamon from Zamboanga was just as good as that one from Ceylon, which was the top value one. It had the same taste and chocolate flavor with mixed with Mindanao cinnamon. However, the tragedy was he died a year after. He died in an accident when he was exploring. So this is from the writings of the, the historian Francisco Magliari. It was written in 1974. However, his assistant 15 years later decided that he'd continue on with the project. So uh, Francisco Salgado uh, started raising cinnamon. He took cuttings from Mindanao and he planted it in Kalawan near Laguna. The, so it's, as you can see, there's a map of Kalawan there. And he was able to make 2,000 cuttings from the first 13 plants brought from Zamboanga. So he was obviously very capable in... Uh, a hort as a horticulturist. But then some years later, the, the, the royal botanist, uh, De Culliar, oops, sorry. Oops, I have to go back. Uh, yes, so De Culliar said, well, we really have to, to try to make some money. You know, the, 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 you know we have good cinnamon, but uh, everyone thinks the ones that the Portuguese have is the best, but we, we, ours is just as good. So uh, Culliar had his own uh, nursery in Malate. So no one really quite knows where that plot of land is anymore. But in order to mass produce cinnamon, they brought it to uh, Tiaong in Tayabas. 
I've been there and it, it is a, a nice place to grow things. However, it didn't look like they were quite capable of growing anything. So this plantation also collapsed and failed. So by, by the end of the 18th, by 1793, uh, cinnamon in the Philippines really was a failure. With its poor quality, cinnamon failed to hold its own against superior foreign brands. So people just ran out of interest about it because, you know, it, they said it's too much work. And I like what uh, Francisco Magliari said. He said, the end of the industry came at last in the 19th century without discounting selfish personal interests, government apathy, graft, and corruption. It seems that the lack of technical know-how was one of the leading factors that killed a promising industry, which could have possibly converted the Philippines into a major rival of Ceylon as a world emporium of cinnamon. So this was an incredible loss of opportunity that, uh, you know, that people have noted. And that's why, in many ways, cinnamon is not part of the, well, our culture in many ways, because uh, people have just forgotten that. Is. And then Miss November has told me in her uh, personal dealings with people, I asked them, why they, what is it about cinnamon? And they said, we don't really, all we use it is pangatong. It's, uh, it's obviously, it would smell very nice when you burn it, but you know that is the lowest value that you can get from from wood. So this brings me to uh, the next part of my talk. So you know, if you look at it, five hundred years of lost opportunity, but it just shows you, in many ways, what happens to cinnamon is also what is happening to many of our uh, native plants because we have so many plants which have very important botanical value. I, I'm glad I'm talking to aromatherapists because, you know, what you are doing is because you, we can smell these powerful scents that are produced by plants. I mean, we, we are innocent uh, bystanders in many ways of the effects of, of these aromas and scents, but, you know, plants, you know, to our understanding uh, have, have these scents in order to, to allow effective reproduction or also to, to stop uh, microbes from infecting them, if you like. But we, we reap the benefits of these very powerful compounds that plants synthesize just from carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, basically. So for us now in 2021, we really have a unique window of opportunity to save our cinnamon species, which are, for quite a number of them are almost extinct. So cinnamon tree conservation programs have recently emerged, and it literally has been recent, you know, really in the last five years. And, you know, by doing something about it, we are empowering local communities to conserve remaining natural cinnamon populations. We can mass produce them and plant new seedlings and develop cinnamon products that can be sold in an ecologically equitable and self-sustaining manner. So I just want to show you some of the interesting things that, you know, our government departments have tried to do. So, for example, in 1992, there was the DNR actually looked into the possibility of uh, utilizing cinnamon. So they came out with this uh, uh, document. So for, as a recommended planting and harvesting. And then very recently, 2017, there's this very nice manual which you can download over the web. And as you can see, there are 25 species of cinnamon in the Philippines. And uh, the, the, most of the cinnamon, the botany of cinnamon has been done by uh, Kosterman, who is a, a very eminent uh, taxon. He's deceased now, uh, who lived in Borneo. But just to give you uh, something out of the, 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 that uh, booklet, they highlighted three promising cinnamon species that could be used for possibly uh, products. And the, the interesting one is the one on the right, which is cinnamon bermanii or mindanense. And I highlighted that the bark is closely allied to cinnamon zeylanicum, which is cinnamomium verum, because uh, it has the potential to be something of that quality. So it is in its appearance, taste and odor, seems to be just as good as Cinnamomum zeylanicum. And we found out in Cebu, they have a, a very interesting species there. And the most common one is cinnamon mercadoi. But 
I just want to point out, uh, you know, l- last year uh, I got to know Dr. J.P. Kandal from Cebu, and I, I t- made him connect with uh, Miss November, and he was very happy to share his, his knowledge. So I'm very pleased that we have our own Filipino expert on cinnamon in the Philippines. You know, so it, it's been a long time that we, we needed an expert, and so he's a young scientist, up-and-coming academic, who needs to be supported. But one of the important things that came out of his studies is the classification of, uh, well, the vulnerability of the cinnamon species. I just highlight those three major ones. Like, So the most common one is cinnamon mercadoi. From that value there, it says it's, it's probably present in 100 thousand square kilometers. The, the land surface of the Philippines is 300,000 square kilometers. So possibly it, it's been reduced in its distribution by half, if not more. But the most vulnerable one is Cinnamomum sebuense, which is, seems to only grow in 700 square kilometers, maybe even less. But possibly because of habitat destruction and Mindanensis is also quite low, but we don't really know how far it has actually grown. And uh, now this is an opportunity to try to, go, to grow it. And so if you also look at the potential of cinnamon, well, one of the things I want to point out is if you look at the, the top producers of cinnamon in the world, Indonesia, China, and Vietnam produce the most. But Sri Lanka, which is the highest value cinnamon, only produces probably a tenth of the world cinnamon, but it is the most highly sought after. Our cinnamon uh, mindanensis, uh, uh, people say, has the potential to be as good as that of Sri Lanka, but we, don't, we know very little about it. The Indonesian, Chinese, and Vietnamese ones is the one that's literally everyone knows uh, all around the world as cinnamon powder. Now, if you look at the import-export value of cinnamon in the Philippines, we import... 29 tons and export six tons. The world produce all these top producers produce in the thousands of tons. So you can reasonably say we have the potential to even grow our own and, and really create a market for for us in the Philippines just from our own products if we knew that it was good good to be used. So last week, uh, no, two weeks ago, Ms. November talked about her wonderful project. And she's literally, you know, with, with the, the people of uh, the, the farmers of uh, Don Salvador Benedicto have, have planted more than 11,000 uh, seedlings of cinnamon. And this is the start of, of, of a, a local industry, if you like. And this is, the, this is the Philippines' largest cinnamon planting program. And this is done through a private, uh, you know, a private uh, venture, if you like. So it shows it's possible to do something. But now I think I'll, I'll go to the, well, the reason why I'm here. I was asked to talk a little bit about the chemistry of cinnamon. But uh, uh, I don't know how, uh, uh, you know, what you all feel about chemistry. But one thing I want to, to, to say is that the thing that, interests me about you as aroma, aroma therapist is the fact that you, you are trying to, to use the, these uh, botanicals because they, they have a, a wonderful scent. And like I said earlier, the scent is a very uh, important thing in the life of plants because you know, aromas uh, mean two things. So like I said earlier, it, it, it's a way of communicating between plants so that they know who they, who they are and how to uh, reproduce and pollinate, if you like. But it's also a lot of these aromatic compounds are very, very powerful antibacterial and antifungal compounds and also stress uh, mitigating compounds in the, the physiology of plants. So, so by using that, it also seems to benefit us as human beings. But I want to talk a, a little bit about the chemistry of it because if you like... Also, just to tell you an anecdote, uh, when I was a young botanist, if you like, one of the things that my, the, the professor I worked with uh, here in uh, Australia, he said, look, you know, when we, when we look for plants, one way of telling if they're, what they are, you know, what species they are and where they could be is by 
using your sense of smell. Don't, don't just look at your sight to see what are the differences in plants, but use your sense of smell to tell one species from another because this can help us uh, clarify what, if one species or another. And I've always held that in the back of my mind. And so you as aromatherapists do that. You, you use your sense of smell and you know that you, you connect the dots in saying that aromas can be of benefit to our general well-being. And this, this is, if you like, our innate capacity to, to think and, and to use that knowledge for, for, for our benefit. So I just want to tell you, well, the story of how we identify uh, compounds like aromatics. And it's a very nice story because the, the person who developed the, te the technique of chromatography is this Russian scientist called Mikhail Sweet. So it's very cute because sweet means color in Russian. So chromatography is the, the, the study of compounds using the, the differences in colors. So what happened was he used this technique to separate out various plant pigments, you know, the different colored pigments, the greens, the oranges, and the reds, for example. But what his discovery a uh, hundred years ago was almost forgotten. And it, but the wonderful thing is it's only recently that they rediscovered what he actually did because at that time people thought that he was crazy and they, they really tried to uh, put aside his work because it, it really was against the, the standard thinking. They, they were jealous essentially by, by the brilliance of his work. But I like what they have in his gravestone in Moscow. He said, he invented chromatography, separating molecules, but uniting people. So I just want to show you what he did, and, and you will, uh, hopefully you'll see the relevance to that in terms of you as aromatherapist. But what he did at the beginning, so if you look at the left side, he had this column filled with powdered limestone. So he, he crushed the leaf, uh, uh, an extract of leaves in alcohol. He put it on the top of the column and then slowly poured ethanol on it. And over time, what happens is the different molecules with the different colors separated out because, you know, obviously they've got different sizes and the way they're attracted to the, uh, to the limestone makes them either go slower or faster in that column. So after a certain amount of time, they will separate out and you, he could see the colors. So, so the chlorophylls, the greens, the, the xanthophylls, the yellows, and the, the carotenoids, the orange. And this was such a brilliant, uh, technique that he developed, but people said, no, it's not possible. But, you know, it took a long time when people copied it. So it comes to us now in a modern form. So this is the instrument that I use in my work to, to identify uh, organic molecules, essentially, you know, these essential oils, for example. And we use the same technique of chromatography. So in one sense, it's what happens is I inject an extract of, of crushed leaves or bark, for example, in, in, in a solvent like alcohol. We put it in this injector here where it's heated up. So, you know, when it's heated up, it's just like in our nose, you know, these volatile compounds essentially evaporate. So they, they go through this very long column. You know, these columns are about 10 to 50 meters long. And essentially, they're just like that limestone tubing. But this is this very thin column is just like the, the diameter of fishing line and it's coiled inside an oven. So according to the boiling point of those compounds, they get separated out. And so they come out one after the other into the de a detector. I mean, I won't explain the, the physics of it, but essentially we can identify the compounds that come out. So this is our instrument in, in our laboratory and it's called a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. But what we have in our lab is something that is, uh, has an extra because this instrument on the right-hand side is essentially a, a weighing pan which is subjected to temperature. So what we do is, for example, we get a piece of cinnamon, cinnamon bark. We put it in this th thermographic analyzer and, and we look at the temperature in which the compound eventually gets decomposed and there's this black tube that goes into the gas chromatogram, which will anal analyze it. So in one sense, you can say we, we actually have these instruments that are called electronic noses. So if you like, our nose can identify so many different smells. 
So this is what this instrument does. It, well, it tells you what the instrument does, but it doesn't tell you whether it's nice or not. It just tells us what it is. And so that goes back to spices and aromatic plants. You know, it's for cooking and it's also for cosmetics and it's also for as as for you as aromatherapy. And uh, you know, people have tested over the years to see what are the biological properties, such as antioxidants and micro antimicrobials. So now we go to cinnamon. So cinnamon is the name of the many species of trees and commercial spice products. And uh, there are 250 species in the genus Cinnamomum. So they're in the family Lauraceae, so like the bay leaves or the laurel. And there are only very few cinnamon spices grown commercially, you know, species that are grown for spices. But even to this date, cinnamon is a very important spice. It's, it's, a, it's fourth in the consumption in the world, so after pepper, garlic powder, and thyme leaves. And what gives cinnamon is its specific aroma is this compound called cinnamaldehyde. So it's an al aldehyde. So it's this, this is the chemical structure for it. It's carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And it's in the essential oil. So the, the, the volatile oils that come from uh, the, the bark and the leaves. Essentially, the oils are, are in little bubbles, if you like, that are oil glands in the leaves. And in the bark, they, they just put there, they're transported there, they're, they're fixed there, and absorbed in the wood, if you like. And another important compound is eugenol. It's, a, it's an al alcohol. Well, it's got this uh, cyclic structure, and it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a type of an alcohol. Now, I, I don't know if you know the word, but this, the word organoleptic. So cinnamon is one of these compounds, which is organoleptic. So it is, uh, it defines certain compounds that, that really turn on our senses, if you like, because we can taste it, we can see the color, we can smell it, and we can feel it. You know, if it's oily, you know, it, it's slimy, if you like, or oily. So th th these are very important compounds that essentially we humans are attracted to. And the essential oils of cinnamon are can, uh, some of the most important ones are terpenes. So these are organic compounds. There's, there's uh, the, the structure of one of the most common ones, which is called limonene, that, which is the most common uh, terpene in uh, citrus. And this is just the, the formal structures where they have 10 carbons or 15 if they're sesquiterpenes or C20s. So terpenes are very important compounds that uh, plants synthesize, and they do a lot of very important things. So the, the major biosynthetic blocks for plant steroids, for example. So cinnamon or cinnamaldehyde or cinnamic aldehyde, you know, occurs in the bark of cinnamon, camphor, and cassia trees, and that's the structure there. And, and at the moment, there is a very strong debate about the type of cinnamon that comes from the different uh, trees from different parts of the world. And as we know, the most important ones are the ones in Sri Lanka. And they called it cinnamon verum. This is the, the, the latest change. Essentially, the, the taxonomists were forced to say, well, call it cinnamon verum because the, the Dutch insisted that this is the only true cinnamon. But it's just a question of branding, while the rest of the cinnamon, and most likely our ones, are related to the Chinese one, which is cinnamon cassia. But as I said earlier, it's interesting that people say that cinnamon, cinnamon mindanensis seems to be much more similar to cinnamon verum. So that, that is something very good for us in the Philippines to explore. So cinnamon verum has more of the terpenes, which are, are the ones that are the most uh, aromatic, most fragrant. But the cassia oils have these compounds called benzaldehyde, methoxy, cinnamaldehyde, and cumarin, which... People are trying to understand, well, how much of that is, uh, should give us some concern because one of the issues about some, some of the cinnamon is too much cumarin is bad for you. Essentially, it, you know, it, it can, per by perception, well, it, it can harm your liver if you, if you take a lot of cumarin. But then there, there needs to be a lot more studies to show whether, it, you know, the cumarin that is in different uh, products of cinnamon species is actually doing harm to people. So this is a very intensely studied aspect at the moment. 
and no one knows anything about the Philippine uh, cinnamon. In fact, just to give you an idea, so looking at the, the GCMS, this is what we come up. So on the left, you can see these are some of the structures. But when, when I do an analysis, we come out with this graph with all the different peaks, which essentially say that these are the compounds that are coming out from the extract. And so I, I'm just showing on, on the right-hand side a more simplified form where you're comparing the, the extract from the leaves and the extract of the bark of cinnamon verum. So the leaves are predominantly producing this eugenol, this, this uh, alcohol, which is you know, also one of the, the most fragrant parts of cinnamon. And cinnamaldehyde, there only very little cinnamaldehyde, but in the bark, there is a predominance of cinnamaldehyde and very little of this eugenol. But this terpene here, linalool, which also is one of the fragrant compounds, is, is very similar. But... If you look at the literature, there's literally only one study, uh, what, when, and this is something that is very easy to do. But in 1974, these two chemists, Lawrence and Hong, looked at the chemical composition of two cinnamon species from the Philippines. So they looked at Cinnamoma mercadoi and Cinnamoma mindanensis. With, with our equipment now, like, like the one I, I showed you, we can do this very easily and we can identify so many, many more compounds. So they showed from the bark of Cinnamon Mercadoi, they were able to extract 17 compounds and from the bark, 29 from Mindanense. So this is already very exciting because some of these not only are very fragrant, but they, they are, have a lot of potential benefit in terms of their pharmacological activity. But for us, you know, for us ordinary people, what is it that uh, excites about these things? You know, thanks to people like Miss November and, and some of the, the food critics now, and hopefully you are aromatherapists, you, you can harness the, the good that comes from the aromas of these cinnamon. So I, I just took some of these things that come from Miss November's website, where you can use cinnamon, so, so cinnamon and lemongrass, you can use it to, to flavor your inner sound, for example, or you can use it in a cocktail or a cinnamon pancake. And going back to that thing of the Mexicans, a Pinoy Champorado, I mean, Champorado really is something that comes from us, not from them in many ways. But, uh, you know, the, the, this already, just looking at these pictures, give you such a sense of well being. And then using the cinnamon leaves as, as a condiment for. Uh, what's this? Correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Vember, but this is a, a dobong pusit, isn't it? That's correct, Dr. Doranila. It's a dobong pusit. <laughs> and, and then uh, just, just to, to finish on this note, uh, just, just, you know, for you people who are aromatherapists, you're in, in one sense what you're doing is, is really simplifying life for us and making these botanicals accessible. But just think of the, 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 the big perfume houses. They've used all these aromas for such a long time, but they make so much money from, from things. And I just want to show you Chanel number no. five, which is probably one of the most famous, if not the most famous perfume that's on, on the planet at the moment. And it's sad to say that what really made it famous was they put their secret ingredient, which was the ilang ilang. Ilang ilang is, is one of our, our indigenous flowers, but we you know, we missed the boat in being able to add value to our ilang ilang as a product, as, as an aroma product in the, in the world market, if you like. So that was the secret product. But if you look at, this is from, actually, this is from the American Chemical Society. Uh, the, this is a very nice poster that they have. Just to show you what, what is it in channel number five that, that people go crazy about and spend lots of money about. But as you can see, uh, the extracts of cinnamon, cumarin, eugenol, linalool are, are some of the important products. And in many ways, it's, it's quite easy to, to reverse uh, engineer this thing because we, we have the instruments, but obviously, you know, you cannot do that legally. So I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. But it just shows you that aroma is something that we have to value. And, and uh, you know, I, I give it to all of you as aromatherapists that you are trying to understand what is it in these aromatic compounds that can be of benefit to us in our normal everyday life.
So I would like to thank you. So dabuk na salamat. So I'm open to questions. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Doranila. <laughs> and drink muna tayo ng cinnamon. Hey, Doc, share uh, so, with us some so, of your Yes, so uh, this is a, a, a piece of cinnamon bar. Uh, I can buy it by, from the local Asian food shop. And I followed Miss November's recipe, just taking a piece the size of a fingernail and then infuse it in, a, in boiling water, well, boiled water for eight minutes and then I, I add a bit of uh, honey, and it, it's it's quite soothing. Actually, just to tell you, uh, a few days ago, I was feeling a bit unwell because it's winter, and uh, I had the typical symptoms for COVID, so I had to get a test. But in the meantime, just to make my, you know, just to give me a sense of well-being, I thought I'd, I'd drink some uh, cinnamon tea. And uh, I, I had a very good sleep last, last night, so I, I reported it to Miss November that, you know, it's. Uh, uh, I was very impressed that it, it gave me such a good sense of well-being, and I slept. So I took it for three nights, and I slept really the best three nights of sleep I've had in quite a long time. <laughs> wow, that's amazing, Doc. Um, could you? I have a few questions, so I will start mm. in the Q and A. But if any uh, anyone else has questions, you can type it down through the chat or turn on your audio and video and just shoot away. So I'll go first, no? Um, Dr. Dorinella, you showed us, um, it's really nice that you showed us how it looked kung parang the, the machine to do GCMS. Because for us, honestly, here in the Philippines, I don't think anyone is testing here mm. in the Philippines, right? So we, uh, even some of the other producers that I know, they had to send their oil samples abroad to have it mm. tested. Mm. And with our Philippine cinnamon, you showed us that the bar would, have the typical cinnamaldehyde and the leaves would have eugenol. Could you please share with us, for the benefit of those who doesn't know, um, what are the like therapeutic or what are the benefits for eugenol and cinnamaldehyde? Like if they take um, cinnamon, bark, tea, like what you're doing. So what can they expect from it? Um, well, I think what, one of the... The, the, the type of thinking that w we have to sort of have is if we take just the individual component like cinnamaldehyde or eugenol and say we, we use it, and, and most of the time if we use it, we, we tend to use too much of it. And, and remember, some of these compounds are very powerful molecules that can actually cause harm to people. But if you use it... Uh, if you like, as an extract of a botanical, it's probably not in, in a concentration that will do harm to people. Because remember, an extract is not just cinnamaldehyde or eugenol, but it is the composition of many, many other uh, essential oils and aromatics in that compound. And in one sense, I like what you do as aromatherapist because you are trying to be careful in looking at what could be a dose which could actually harm people. And now it's only now that we are actually trying to quantify properly what can be done. But usually you do it only at one at a time because we are not capable yet of looking at the mixtures that are in, in natural products that are an individual good or bad, if you like. Take, for example, I mean, I, I like the, the fact that, uh, if you like, one of the most important botanicals we have is aspirin. Aspirin is an extract of the, the willow tree. So it's a salicylic acid, which is a very important plant hormone and also an important uh, compound that does a lot of benefit for the plants. But thankfully, it also does good to us human beings. But when we only started using uh, uh, aspirin, if you like, or salicylic acid extract, just on its own, obviously it, it was good for our headaches. And, but then they realized it was bad for you because it actually thinned your blood. But, you know, this is one of the challenges of modern medicine is it is so reductionist. So, you know, what you're doing also gives us a chance to step back and actually look at things so that we actually use things in moderation too. And, and so me as a chemist, I, I personally cannot say if it's good or bad because that's not my job. It's the medical scientists who are trying to look at the causation, if you like. But then we can also look at the collective experience of, of humans over 
thousands of years in using some of these compounds. And so in many ways, what you as aromatherapists is doing is asking us to, to go back to simpler things that in, in many ways also telling us we have to have a health, healthier lifestyle because if we overload ourselves with one thing, it's bad for you. I agree with you 100%. Um, Dr. Doranilla, somebody is raising his hand. Peter, do you have a question? You can unmute yourself, Peter. Yes, I, am I, you can hear me. Yes. Good morning. Uh, I'm very interested in your talk, and uh, it's opening actually a lot of uh, new knowledge to me. But I'm experiencing it myself. I'm living in Davao, and I'm actually uh, planting um, cinnamon myself. Oh, sure. Not on a large scale, uh, I, it's uh, because mainly I'm planting grasses. Uh, and uh, what really strikes me in your presentation is uh, that you say that the uh, Mindanaoan um, cinnamon is of same quality as the Sri Lankan. Uh, why did it not take off? What is the reason really? Well, uh... Was it the processing? Was it a political issue? Was it uh, uh, what was the reason uh, why why cinnamon? I grew up in Europe, so cinnamon was all around <laughs> mm, me. Yes. I'm, I'm, you know, Christmas means cinnamon. Uh, <laughs> uh, food means cinnamon. Very true. So very true. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, this is this is very uh, integrated in my life. So when I came here in the Philippines, uh, I was somehow very disappointed because. Uh, uh, there's no spices around anymore. Mm -hmm. Even if you go into the into the Philippines low food, there's missing <laughs> out such a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm searching for 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 uh, nutmeg uh, duguan seedlings. I cannot find it. You know, it, it, it's really stunning. So why did the cinnamon not take off from the Philippines? Was it the processing, or what was the reason in your idea? Well, I, I can only hazard a guess, but you know, in my reading, it is so fascinating to, to see that such, such a wonderful scented uh, plant has, has not entered into our, our active culture today. And one of the things I think, I'm talking to Miss November, there is a lot of anecdotal evidence saying that they, they actually... Some people have said that the cinnamon is actually a bad tree. And, and so they said to cut it down because it brings you bad luck. Isn't that right, uh, Mr. Vemba? Can you hear me? Uh... Yes, that's, uh, no, that's true. And, and, and so there have been many active, and also the fact that people, because they have not, uh, in many ways, probably lost the value in it, then they've only used it as log as logs, if you like. I mean, I'm sure it smells very nice if you if you barbecue <laughs> using uh, wood chips of cinnamon. But uh, like I said, that's a waste of, of a cinnamon. But uh, you know, it yeah, it's a, it's a mystery why it has not sort of been part of our normal food culture. And uh, you know, I, I, it's 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 amazing thing that cinnamon has driven the world politics in so many, many uh, centuries. But here in the Philippines, where we have some of the, well, unknown source of, of cinnamon, it, it's we've been bypassed. And, and so this is, I think now, this is an opportunity to, to make people be aware. And, and I think I encourage you, Peter, to get in touch with Miss November to see if you can do things, you can have some synergies in, in not only discovering where these things are and, and also growing. And one thing I have to say is I would like to encourage a greater input of science. So people like Dr. Picardell to, to really play a part because he, he you know, he, he's, he's one of our authorities. And I'm glad to see also there is Dr. Maribel Ago with us because she has also been working a lot with cinnamon over so many, many years. And I see she wants to ask a question. And uh, I, I would like to ask Maribel if you can make a comment on what Peter is saying about why cinnamon is not part of our food culture in, or, or normal culture. So, Maribel, are you uh, yes, able to... Uh, yes, I just unmuted. Good morning. Uh, 
it was very enlightening no? the the discussion that, that she presented yeah actually I'm, I'm waiting for a reply from dr madulid with regards to the history of cinnamon cultivation in the philippines during the spanish times uh there was a plantation in That's laguna mm-hmm. and um it was doing very well up until the agriculturist wasn't able to get the support from the governor that, that was during the spanish times yeah, um, for the cultivation and it totally disappeared we tried to even look for some remnants of that forest or plantation and we can find any um any of this so it seems to be political yeah. during those spanish times but i think um we just don't we just didn't consider that uh Mindanaense could be a potential crop, mainly because the product perhaps originated or is from Mindanao, and <laughs> nobody really has invested again to propagate it. That is my opinion for why it was not propagated or cultivated in the current times. Um, people really don't know that there is such a crop currently. No? But during the Spanish times or early American times, it was considered. In fact, it's one of the crops, major crops in Laguna, even before coffee was introduced. That's correct, yes. Mm. Yes. Mm. That is why when we started to do the research, um, we wanted, aside from looking at the taxonomy, we wanted to have it revived, the interest of people to have it revived, especially uh, because this species, this group of plants, are becoming popular in other countries as aromatics and spices. But the other side of it is that there are literature that it causes cancer. Uh, there's also, there are also articles that show that this is really good for the same uh, part of the body, no? for the digestive system. So we need to screen all yeah, the species correct. as much yeah. as possible to know which is good and which is not good to think that we are actually drinking it it's it's not just um putting this oil or whatever in this on the skin no it, it's something that we ingest so we we delved into that research before uh, some Bell. are actually very promising mm-hmm. maribel if i may kick in in that regard in europe cinnamon is there's no discussion about its uh, its properties it is used everywhere mm. it's used mm. in baking it's used in uh, in, uh, uh, in in dishes <laughs> it's 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 if if you go into a christmas market in europe yeah. uh, the the flavor of cin- uh, the, the, the the scent of cinnamon is all around you mm. and uh, you go into supermarkets you can buy cinnamon it, it cinnamon is is there's no discussion about it that its properties are harmful. It's mm-hmm. just all around. It's just, uh, uh, my question really is, why did it not make the mm-hmm. way even to Europe? Because uh, mm-hmm. Sri Lanka is on the same way. Uh, and uh, uh, the quality of Mindanao and uh, uh, cinnamon is obviously is obviously uh, mm. the same. Mm. Yes. So I think, Peter, you, you can play a role in this because... As uh, Dr. Agoa said, th- there is so much unknown, and we have that opportunity, you know, using all the capacity we have in, in the nation to do this. And, and scientists have an important role to this. And, 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 you know, in my reading, for example, about the Qumran, because this is the main issue that people are trying to, to come to grips with, they say too much Qumran in, in the cinnamon from Asia is harmful. But when they, the, the studies that I've seen, they cannot even show that w- w- within trees, the variation of cumarin production between trees in, in uh, Indonesia, in China is so variable. So they don't even know 
what causes the in, the high amount of coumarin in certain accessions of Cinnamomum cassii, for example. So, so there, you know, th this is where plantations come into to play because you you can factor out some of the things that, and, and you can essentially breed out the coumarin production. And and so th these are the things where science can help. Can I uh, say something? Yes, Ms. Yes. Cynthia, you have a question? Yes, I'll do just some clarification. Uh, Canela, Kalinga, these are the, the, the names that we refer to, mm, yes. uh, cinnamon, especially in the southern Philippines. I'm from Mindanao, mm -hmm. and cinnamon is part of my childhood. Oh, cinnamon fantastic. is mother for me because <laughs> my mother cooks stew with cinnamon. Our lechon has cinnamon leaves, mm -hmm. and we drink cinnamon tea. Fantastic. See, I think your problem is you're from Manila, <laughs> you're in the city, and you don't know we natives in the peripheries eat. You Fantastic. see, I'm, I'm an anthropologist, and I have done oh, work on ethnopharmacology among Atis of Central Philippines. Mm. The Atis sell various kinds of materia medica, and one of those is the cinnamon. Mm. I don't know what species it is, but one of the ingredient of their materia medica is the cinnamon and they usually say use it for tea for your stomach trouble uh, if you cannot yeah if you cannot sleep it will relax you you know so so indigenous peoples still use it but we people in the cities don't know about it anymore because like native fruits cinnamon is a victim of uh, commercialization. Mm -hmm. Cinnamon is a backyard sp uh, spice, you know, mm -hmm. just like our native fruits. We don't sell them by the, mm -hmm. by the plantation size, like the pineapples and the bananas of Davao, you know? So we're not into this plantation. So it is our garden, it is our backyard that produces this native native spices. In my studies in, in Surigao del Norte, in the small islands, they have canela for tea. Fantastic. They don't drink coffee, they just drink canela and because they say it makes, it helps them in the good condition, their well-being, you know. So it's not lost in our culture, it is lost in new city people's culture. <laughs> You see, and you only know cinnamon from the Western recipes, exactly, yeah. like desserts, you know, pastries. But for us, very guilty. Yeah. <laughs> but for us in Mindanao, we use it. We use it a lot. We use it a lot. Oh, you should try the Cagayan de Oro uh, lechon. There, there are leaves inside, you no, know, the lechon, leaves of cinnamon, and that re removes the. Mm. The gamey taste of mm -hmm. our uh, black uh, pigs, you know, we have Corona uh, Buta, black pigs. So we, we use that and together with, we, you see, we have ways of combining spices mm -hmm. which are not done in the zone, like lemongrass and cinnamon together, yeah. you see. Uh, but you see, it's also, it's our flora and fauna. Yes. Because Luzon, I don't think, you have a lot of that in Luzon cinnamon, no? There is one in UP. In, uh, uh, actually, the, it's documented that cinnamon grew all the way up to the north of the Philippines, even to the foothills of Baguio. And it, it's just all been lost. Oh, we haven't lost it in the south. Yes, that's, that's a good thing, yes. Yeah, we, 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 do, we still use it, you know. And by the way, you say Kayumana, did you say that? That's that's what they said. Yes, it should be kayu manis because yes, manis is sweet. Also, yeah, the Indonesian in, that's in Bahasa yeah. is manis also. Yes. Yeah. Well, oh, it, it's just a clarification because uh, it's very it exists. You know, I mean, there is a culture of the use of cinnamon, medicinal or uh, food in your food. We we still do it. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Miss Cynthia. Yeah, I'm honestly very guilty of that because, like, <laughs> I'm very uh, um, urban, <laughs> urban situated. Um, I'm a city girl, so 
anything cinnamon is honestly very new to me and that is the reason why we're doing these efforts to provide education and awar- awareness to people because it seems very um out of touch for us mm-hmm. and i'm just very happy that miss november is here to um share her knowledge about it dr dorinil is here to share more knowledge about it but sir i have a few more questions here on the chat because ayoko silang um yes of course ma- madaan, uh, ma- pass by. um somebody's asking lou is asking lou is also a certified aromatherapist by the way so She's asking if cinnamon oil is easily adulterated and are there grades to cinnamon to mark which ones are high quality or not? I think anything is very easily adulterated. And that's why instruments like what I have can tell you whether it's adulterated or not because we can uh, very readily identify what are the other uh, compounds that they, they put in to adulterate it. And, and you know, nowadays, you know, th- these kinds of analysis are not very, they shouldn't be very expensive. And uh, the, the, I imagine in most of the city centers, the, the, there should be a gas chromatograph in some institution. And of, obviously, the, the more the, they get used, the better it is. But it, it really takes out the, uh, the, well, the unknown about it, because this, these are very powerful fingerprinting tools. I mean, you know, and they're very simple to use nowadays even. So as I can say, it, uh, if, if you want certification for these products, I, I encourage you to, to do it. But you know, if, if there are people who have access to a, a, cin- a cinnamon tree in their backyard, for example, they can make uh, their, their own botanicals themselves. Then they know where it comes from. Mm-hmm. How about sir? The are they are there grades to cinnamon? Like, how would you say that the cinnamon from Ceylon is more valuable than they say from Vietnam? Are there uh, well, quantifiable it's the, it's, it's, markets? It's, it's the market that sets that. It's it's not one is better than the other. In fact, mm-hmm. as you can see, there's only ten percent of the world's cinnamon production is from Sri Lanka, and it is even dropping because they are losing the capacity to uh, grow and to process it because it is also very hard work. You know, the culture around uh, growing and, and producing cinnamon for, for the wider markets is getting less and less, even though it's profitable. But, you know, most of our, our cinnamon now is very easily extracted by the Chinese and the Vietnamese, and uh, they just make the chips and but so the the thing is to value add it so that people appreciate uh the, the real benefit in it and not just mass produce it in many ways but i uh, i i just want to go back to what peter said you know this is the question people are obviously rightfully concerned about things like cumarin but when you look at how much uh, cinnamon products, the Europeans, the, the, the Dutch, the Germans, for example, eat in their daily lives. You think if, if we have a problem, we would see a lot more people dying of cancer in Holland and Germany, but that's not the case. So I, I think we, we have to have a sense of perspective. In it. But I mean, knowledge is good and we, we have to protect people, but look at it in the wider perspective. Uh, what do you say to that, Peter? Um, I think uh, um, uh, if I really think about Europe, uh, there's no question about uh, um, cinnamon of being harmful uh, because it's approved by uh, the, the, uh, the food administration. Exactly, it's yes. an integrated part of our life. And uh, uh, if I just imagine you cut out cinnamon uh, from our culture, there's no Christmas scent anymore. There's no Christmas market anymore. Uh, what do I do with my apple strudel? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, there's, I need cinnamon for that. Um, if, you, if you think about uh, uh, a Greek dish, which is a cinnamon stew, mm. if you think about uh, the whole Mediterranean uh, with the cinnamon tea, uh, it, is so, uh, it is so integrated in the, in the European culture that uh, uh, there's no... There's no discussion about it. Mm-hmm. You have the mulled wine, which is yes, uh, exactly, uh, exactly. With, uh, mm-hmm. with cinnamon. It's 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 so in the culture, and it is an approved uh, spice. 
which is marketed on a very, very big scale. Mm. Not, uh, 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 you, you said it's the fourth uh, most important spice uh, mm. in the ranking. Mm. So um, uh, I, would, I would really disregard all this, uh, all this um, discussion about is it harmful. Of course, if you have too much of it, everything can be harmful. That's right. I agree. Um, so um, uh, I would not try to be entangled in that. Um, I think we, we, we should be clear it's an important spice and what can we do and what can, uh, can be done with it. Uh, I think that's, that's probably the, ma the most important thing yes. to, to think about. Yes, yes. And I think it, it's so obvious. It shows that there is an opportunity for the Philippines. You know, if, if you think we one million ex-Filipinos balik, balik bayans who live in countries which eat cinnamon, if you can just access a little bit of that uh, catchment, how good it would be for the Philippines, you know, for all the farmers who would grow cinnamon. You know, so people like Miss November are, are really doing an important part to try to, to be a driver in making this something that is of benefit for the local people also. So, and, and, you know, us who live outside can, can do our part in, in this way by using Philippine cinnamon. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Peter and Sir uh, Dr. Dorinila. I actually brought out my cinnamon barks here, and I want to push the man all the negative part of cinnamon. I want to bring bring forth all the benefits and positive sides of Philippine cinnamon. Perhaps Miss November or Miss Tina can share with us how do you handle the cinnamon bark? How do you actually uh, make the tea for for city, um, you know, city girls like me? <laughs> Thank you, Jerby. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for organizing this event. No? Uh, I would really like to uh, affirm what uh, Ma'am Cynthia said, no? that the culture of cinnamon is never lost in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. I challenge anyone here, you go to any town, you find a stall of the ati or the IP, I bet you they have Philippine cinnamon. So that's one. So it's never lost. In fact, um, I also challenge you, you go to any uh, IP community, you will find cinnamon. So basically, the IP tribes have become the guardians of the Philippine cinnamon because the cinnamon is, you know, like really gold, no? Because of uh, its powers, its medicinal and food and cosmetic powers. It has become so commercialized. So... So that's one. In fact, and I think that uh, in the Philippines, they don't even make a distinction of the, not much distinction of the Kalingag, as, doc, as India said. They don't call it cinnamon, they just call it Kalingag. So it seems like from my observations in the communities, by the way, the project that we have now in DSB is really the seat of the Ati in Negros. Mm -hmm. no? That's why they have kept the cinnamons alive. Uh, also to Peter, uh, to answer your question, why has cinnamon disappeared in the Philippines? And I told Dr. Doronila about this. One time, uh, we have a project with World Vision Philippines of planting cinnamon in Cebu. And then when I went up to the mountain, I know that the topography, in that, that, that topography, the Philippine cinnamon would really uh, grow. But we have been searching for cinnamon for one hour and I cannot find any. And then it's a good thing I brought the bark. And then there was this old man who came and I asked him, do you have Kalingag, Mana, and all the local names of cinnamon? And he said, can you, I let him smell the cinnamon and said, you know, this place had so much cinnamons when I was young, but that priest said that it is a uh, bad luck, malas. So they ask us to cut all the cinnamon trees. Mm. So if you go now in the lowlands, there is hardly any Philippine cinnamon. And it is only the IP tribes that kept the Philippine cinnamon, kept it growing and uh, did not cut down the cinnamon. So, so that's it. And the third point as to your question, Jerby, um, your question is how do we get no, the Philippine cinnamon? So actually, that uh, when you, I also would like to affirm what Dr. Doronila said, that we have to take hold 
in terms of owning the Philippines you know, by planting one in your backyard because you can use the bark and that you don't even have to wait for the bark. You can wait, uh, you can use the leaves for your tea, for your food, for your lechon, as what people in Mindanao until now do. Uh, so for that bark uh, in particular, no. so first is you have two ways to harvest the bark from the tree. You, If you have a mature tree, you can harvest the stem. And from the stem, you can uh, wash the stem, no? take out the small stems and the leaves, and then um, scrape out the outer bark. And then you loosen the inner bark by rubbing two woods. And then you make an incision and then you peel off the inner bark. And then you uh, air dry the cinnamon bark. Don't put it under the sun. It will uh, degrade the flavor. Uh, in about two weeks, uh, if you don't have a dryer, it will dry out. And then you can pack it in uh, very tight containers to preserve the cinnamon. The one we harvested for uh, in 2017 until now smells as good. So that will last you a long, long time. But uh, I, but the uh, dried cinnamon is nothing to the fresh cinnamon. So I encourage everyone to please plant one in your backyard. Thank you so much for that, Ms. Dina. But again, I will reiterate this question. I know I asked this uh, to you from you na kanina umaga. Um, I have Ms. Dina cinnamon bark samples here. And I do notice that there are white um, specs here. <laughs> Just for everyone again who's in the city who might not know any better, um, Sir, uh, Dr. Doronila or Ms. Tina, could you please share with us now? This is okay. This is safe not to be uh, simmered and prepared as tea or is this not, uh, is this molding or, or what? Oh yeah, could that's share actually us? when you go, you can you can eat that uh, but uh, you won't uh, have, uh, you won't be able to get the maximum effect. <laughs> so, uh, as I instructed you earlier, <laughs> I suggest a gel for 400 ml or two cups of water. And then once it boils, you lower the fire, drop about one uh, pinky size, one gram. Just take one gram of cinnamon per day and then simmer it five minutes. You will know it's good when the red hue comes out and it's uh, really aromatic. Dr. Doreen, yes. I want to say something. Yes. I think somebody wants to share. I think I think it's Miss Miss Cynthia wants to say yeah, yeah. something. Okay. I just I just want to let you know. I always have a cinnamon sticks in my bag. You know, <laughs> it, it, every time. If you have stomach trouble, you can just chew a little. And if you think you oh. are having bad breath, you can also chew. Then you will smell like cinnamon when you talk. It really helps. Wow. Yeah. You can choose. How it. about the storage, um, Miss Cynthia, or anyone who can answer? How about the storage? Should we keep this away from sunlight? Should we put um, silica packets? To well, can, absorb I say some, can I say something uh, from, from uh, the point of view of <laughs> chemist? Well, remember, all these compounds are what are called volatile organic compounds. So, in other words, they, 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 you need a bit of warmth. To, to let it become a, a gas, essentially. So the best thing to do is keep it in a cool, dry place. And uh, they will, it will last a long time. In fact, this is the good thing about uh, cinnamon bark. I would rather use cinnamon bark th than cinnamon powder because cinnamon powder, after a while, you're just eating sawdust or, or drinking sawdust Be because the moment you crush up a compound, a lot of the volatiles do evaporate out. But there's still, but it shows you because there's so much of it. There, there is still some because there, there. You know, if you think of the wood, it's it's like tissue paper. So it uh, it blots the the essential. The, most of them are oily, but if if you have a bark, it it stays there until you break it into a smaller uh, size and surface exposed to sur greater surface area. But you know, the best thing is always cool, dry, and dark place. Thank you for that. So I kept it already. I don't want to. I don't want to compromise the volatile compounds. <laughs> but more questions are in our chat, Doctor Doranila. Um, someone is asking, would you know if there are harmful reaction if you infuse the cinnamon bark into plant oils? Like, are there going to be chemical constituents that are going to be extracted that's too strong for the skin, for example? 
Well, I, I think you aromatherapists know what to do with this. I mean, you do all these tests, these dermal tests, isn't it? And uh, but but there is a lot of literature also saying that there are people who are intolerant of certain fragrances, and it is not, in in one sense we still don't know why people are allergic to certain things. But some people, uh, whether you like it or not, will will be allergic to these things. But you know, it. I think it is more an exception than the rule. Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, obviously, uh, I think we always have to repeat that if you use too much of something, it will always do you bad. <laughs> Thank but, you. Uh, All but right. Then. Mm -hmm. Also, one of the things uh, that the good thing about cinnamon uh, cinnamon oil extract is if you use it in your diffusers, it is probably the the, the least harmful way of of benefiting from. Uh, cinnamon, because you know this issue of coumarin doesn't exist if you if you uh, use a diffuser, because you're you're not going to you're not going to ingest any coumarin. You know you you need a lot of coumarin to make you to to give you liver damage anyway, which is also most of the time highly reversible. But you know th this is the thing to put things in the right context. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think with regard to coumarin, as a botanical formulator standpoint. I think the only watch out for there is that coumarin, I know, is a highly photosensitive ingredient. So it mm -hmm. can, it might cause dermal burning. But if you do infusions, for example, you infuse cinnamon barks into your oil, I don't think there is any um, impact on that as regards to using the essential oil itself. That is why there are um, pretty low dermal limits for cinnamon bark. Okay, okay. Um, for everyone's knowledge. And then here are some of the questions. Sorry, over time. Okay, are you familiar in what soil climate or topography the Philippine cinnamon grows? Uh, I, th I think there is enough literature li like that, uh, the publication from the DNR that, that will tell you it's uh, ecological you know, what is ecological requirements, but it seems to grow, you know, on, on mount hillsides up to a certain uh, altitude, but uh, it's quite easily accessible. I mean, I, I, unfortunately, I'm not in the Philippines, so I, I cannot even tell you. Well, I've seen some cinnamon, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know enough to tell you a, a proper answer to that, but there, there is the information that can be accessed and uh, if you just contact Miss November, she has she she literally has an electronic library of a lot of very valuable information, and uh, and and much much more. You know the propagation of it. She has some experts too. Jerby, okay, may I answer the question? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, uh, we've seen. I have cinnamon in my backyard, and I'm in the lowland. And we've seen the cinnamon being planted from lowland up to the upland, up to 2,000 meters above sea level. Uh, what is only important about the cinnamon is one, it has to be partially shaded. Mm, yes. Don't ever plant it in full sun. So that's one. Second, it loves water, so but not flooded. Uh, so you can plant it in your garden, in the pot, or if you want to plant it on the ground, you can plant it in areas uh, where it's partly shaded. And uh, means and may uh, areas in the garden that's partly flooded, no, or sometimes when it rains heavily, it floods, you can plant it there. So in the distance, it uh, if you want to grow it into a big tree, uh, the DNR recommends four by four or three by three. But for us we have, who have small gardens, you can plant it in a big pot. Half drum is okay. One fourth drum is okay. My best suggestion is uh, for conservation, you can grow it into a big tree if you have a big garden. But you can always cut it into a bush-like if you'd like to, uh, no, to uh, harvest the leaves. What's nice about the cinnamon is uh, once you cut it, that when you cut the stem, it bounces back. It gives you more stem. So you'll have a bushy uh, plant. And the also nice things about it is you can use it also as decorative because the new shoots are uh, brown to red and looks yes. very nice. If you let it flower, the stingless bees are attracted. By the way, uh, in the audience, uh, Doji Marquez is there. He's also an enthusiast of the cinnamon. He has planted the cinnamon along with his native stingless bees. So he will have a very powerful product.
Wow, thank you so much for that, Miss November. So for everybody who has planting, propagation, um, questions about cinnamon, you can get in touch with Miss November or Miss Tina. But sir, uh, Dr. Doranila, how can they get in touch with you? Somebody is asking. Um, I can give you my email. It's that simple. <laughs> yes. Or, uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't try to answer my emails. So. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, lang. Um, we can share Dr. Doranina's email yes. after the session or through the Alliance of the Philippine Aromatherapists. Group. Yes. We're going to be yes. posting it there. But ito, one final question. I think this is important before we wrap up the session. And maybe you, Miss November, can also chime in. How is the concern on intellectual property rights and patent for these types of products, especially if the materials are, are collected from forests, being managed by indigenous communities? So are there like IPO um, rules uh, around the, this? The, the, it, the, the simplest answer I can give is there is no IPO on, on, on a plant. It's only if you actually do uh, propagation, you know, what you call this modern propagation to create a new variety that uh, you, well, you, you can apply for a, uh, an IPO in many ways. But I think the question that should be asked is if the best people to, who look after these uh, native plants with native trees. Uh, so they've, been, they've, they've looked after them for such a long time. We have to find a way of making sure that they, they look after them properly because you know, it is so well documented that the best forest protectors all around the world are the indigenous people. So it is up to us to favor that their existence and livelihoods are protected. Therefore, we have a chance of making sure that forest conservation actually happens properly. And, you know, it's for the benefit of all of, all of humanity. And, uh, you know, we, we, the, the, uh, uh, indigenous people are not ignorant. They, they have a lot of common wisdom, you know, the traditional ecological knowledge, which we are starting to value more and more now. So to be able to access that information in a respectful manner and to give them the, their rightful place in being custodians is what I think we should do. I agree, sir. I think that's one of the troubles in living in the modern world. We are so concerned of who gets to be the first, IPOs and patents. Mm -hmm. And I, I am, I'm also like baffled because like for the people here, they don't want to share how they distill things. But in the U.S., when I talk to other aromatherapists, they're very open like, oh, this is how we gather the plants and this is how we process the distilling. Dito talaga, lahat ng nakakausap ko parang, eh, bawal. Or I, I do have to sign NDAs at times. So, parang, okay, I, I respect that because me, I am from the city. I have zero knowledge on how to plant and process these things. So I just, you know, watch and learn. But yun lang, I, I noticed that a lot. Na parang, there's always a concern of protecting how they do it. Na parang, should it, shouldn't it be like parang dapat you have you have to promote it so that everyone can 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 plant and propagate. But if you want to really drive um, an education and awareness, shouldn't you be sharing those knowledge? In lang. How about Miss um, November or Miss Cynthia? Maybe you can yes, chime in, Miss Cynthia. No, I think the problem here is uh, when one unscrupulous planter patents the particular species coming from an indigenous land. That becomes a problem. It happened many times in the Amazonian Brazil. Mm, exactly, yeah. You know, and uh, big corporations have patented indigenous people's plants. So I think we have to be careful about this. Mm. Mm. I see you. Okay, that, that's kind yes, of sad. May I answer also? <laughs> yes, please. Yes. Yeah. Uh, first, from what I know, we cannot patent the plants here in the Philippines. Exactly, we can yeah. only patent the design of or the process of uh, yeah, or the process or of planting. Mm -hmm. No, uh, the reason for that, uh, I actually plants. I already pat I already applied for the patent for the distillation of essential oil and aromatic water. The reason for that is in the Philippines, if you don't patent it and someone patents it, you can be blocked from your own uh, discovery. So uh, that's why we have to patent it. So that's why I already applied. But whether or not I will collect from my patent is up to me, no? 
but it is patenting is a protection so i uh, i think the the tawag dito, the for for the ips there are many uh, technology business incubators that you can um, contact to help you apply for your uh, patents no uh, if you don't know any you can contact me i have been helped by uh, Technological University of the Philippines. They had us uh, undergo a training in the intellectual property office, which, by the way, was free. So uh, please patent your, you know, your uh, inventions. Especially, uh, Mam Cynthia mentioned that they're using a certain medicine. Oh, by the way, I have this acupuncturist. She's been an acupuncturist for 30 years and she's also an acupuncturist of the NPAs, no? New People's Army, because they cannot go down to hospitals to get treated when they get hit by bullets. They use acupuncture to manage the pain. And guess what they use also to help uh, relieve pain? It is cinnamon. So they have these uh, oils and one of the ingredients that they use is cinnamon. Thank you so much for that, Miss November. Wow, that's that's really enlightening. No, na parang there's really a threat if you don't patent your things here. Um, anybody else? Final questions, Malana. So I think we're we're Derby. done. But before, yes, yes. Derby, excuse me. Uh, I think Mr. Jojo Rome wanted to say something. Uh, Jojo is head, is founder of a uh, home farming club in the Philippines. And we are in talks to do, to replicate what we are doing here in Negros, uh, in Davao, because he's also uh, working with the IPs. Jojo, please uh, introduce yourself. Sir Jojo, please come on, on, on stage. <laughs> I'm asking you to un De, unmute. Me. Unmute. Ayan. Unmute na. Okay. Yes. Uh, hello. Video. You can turn your video on. Okay. Uh, start video. Do you cannot start your video because the host has denied. Okay. Start my Ayan, video. Ask to okay. Start. There you Ayan. go. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Ako si Jojo Rom. Salamat. Salamat, Ma'am November. Um, Masaya ako na narinig na part ako dito na tama yung narinig ko kay Ma'am Cynthia and and to the speaker also na ang dami talagang benefit ang cinnamon and then one time pumunta kami sa sa Pakibato is a rebel infested area for the last 40 years and it was until Ma'am Irene Santiago who is Together with us now, she's she's part in this uh, <coughs> uh, meeting. Na nag surrender ang mga NPA, and then one of the projects na ginawa namin is to introduce to them the urban container gardening or home farming, uh, home farming para sa mga mga mothers na uh, nagpapakain sa kanilang mga anak, and then uh, a month after. Or two months after na nag-introduce kami na container gardening, sabi ko, I need to go up to the mountains uh, of Pakibato to check. Kasi yung sa home farming kasi is more on the subsistent level lang siya. Uh, grow what you eat, eat what you grow. But after that, ano yung magiging, uh, uh, ano yung after nito? Kasi pagkain lang, okay na. Assuming na nag-grow sila ng pagkain, uh, they will be... Uh, Ano na sila, busog na sila. And then the hunger is resolved at the household level. Pero yung enterprising nila, yung enterprises nila, paano sila masusustain, masusustain itong program ng uh, Peace 911 or mm -hmm. the, the, the peace work of, of, of the above city with the, with the uh, rebels kung wala silang livelihood. So sabi ko, we need to, uh, tawag nito, meron tayong uh, natural resources mapping. So nakita namin doon, Kasi bago bago yung piece na yun naman, mayroon na kung mayroon na kung kaibigan nagbigay sa akin ng sinamon. Sabi niya sa bundok na ito makikita. And then pumunta kami doon, dala-dala ko yung bark ng sinamon. So 
nag nag nag-check ako doon ano yung pwedeng magiging ano yung endemic ng mga kahoy doon o uh, mga trees with uh, pharmaceutical value or medicinal value na pwedeng pwedeng abundant doon na pwedeng nilang magiging livelihood later on. So dinala ko yung cinnamon hoping na ma ma, ma, ma check ko kung ano na talaga it, available uh, present ba talaga itong uh, cinnamon sa Pakibato. Nag-meeting kami di, with the community, isang community doon, hindi nila alam. no? Kung mayroon mang nakaalam, dalawa, tatlo. Out of siguro mga 60 katao na nag, nag ano doon, attend, uh, dalawa lang yung may alam, yung matatanda, mga matatanda. Sabi sa akin, uh, ano yan? Sabi ko, amoyin ninyo. Pag pangalanan mo siyang sina mo, di nila alam. Pero pag ipaamoyin mo sa kanila lahat, pasapasa sila, yung iba... May question sa isip. Pero yung alam mo kung sino yung may knowledge tungkol doon. Kasi, ah, mayroon ito dito, sir. So, siguro mga dalawa-tatlo lang ang may alam. Kadalasan matatanda. Sabi ko, sino yung may alam dito? Ano yung pwede nyo ba i-share sa, sa lahat ng mga tao dito na may, ano, na, na ano yung pakinabang nito? Sabi ng isa, sabi niya, gamot ito, sir. Dito yung ginagamit namin. Kaya hindi kami bumababa sa siyudad para bumili ng, ng gamot noon dahil mayroon ito dito. So, ibig sabihin, mataas talaga medicinal value. Sabi ko, alam ba ito ng lahat? Eh, sabi ng iba, yun na nga, hindi namin alam yan, sir. Kung alam lang namin, hindi na sana maubos yung pera namin kabibili ng kakabili ng gamot. Sabi ko, kulang talaga ang knowledge. And then the second most striking is yung sabi ng isang, yung hindi ko lang pangalanan, hindi ko naman talaga alam yung ano, pero yung isang sabi na dato doon, sabi niya, lumapis sa akin, paano kami magkakapera dyan? Mag, mag, ano ba daw ako? Magkumpra ba? Sabi ko, hindi ako komprador ng cinnamon. Sabi ko, kung ang sa amin lang dito is alam nyo ba ito at saka alam na ba ng lahat, yun lang yung sadya namin dito kasi before natin ibenta ito sa ibang tao o sa i-export or ano yung ano natin is dapat makabenefisyo muna ang community. Kasi pag hindi makabenefit ang community sa high-valued product na ito, it will be the source of conflict. no Magiging source of conflict siya. Habang valuable ito sa ibang mga tao, kasi tayo alam natin ang benefits nito. All the benefits, halos lahat ng benefit nasa cinnamon. It's like a pharmacy tree. It's, sabi nga ni Ma'am November, is a bullet, silver bullet for uh, parang AIDS or ano, cancer ba. So maraming beneficyo siya na hindi alam ng mga IPs na source nito. Ang challenge dito, sabi ko, is number one, is how to inform The IP community, this is, this is a valuable crop or tree na sila ang may hawak nito at dapat may program ito. Mayroon akong ginawang parang 7P. Eh. Uh, first P is the, the protection of the standing mother tree. Kasi pag alam, kung sinabi ko yun na magkakapera kayo nito, hindi pa kami natapos sa meeting, may, nag, may tumakbo na doon sa, sa forest, nagputol na ng isang puno. Dinala doon sa amin, kalahati ng sako yung bar. Sabi ko na to, ito na yung sinabi mo, sir. Sabi ko, hindi ito po. <laughs> Sabi ko, yun na nga yung program natin. You have to protect the standing mother tree and inform the, the, the community na malaki ang benepisyo ng kahoy na ito sa community nyo kasi it will, pro, it will preserve or conserve your money na hindi palaging lumalabas sa bundok. Kasi sabi ko sa kanila, kung sabihin ko sa inyo na magkakapera kayo nito at pinutol ninyo ito lahat dito, magkakapera kayo for a time. But when, kung magkaubusan na ito, naging healthy ang taga-city o taga-Europe o kahit sa ang bansa ang bibili nito, tayo dito na uubusan. By the time na nagkasakit, nagkasakit na tayo, yung pera na nakuha natin out of the sales of cinnamon, Mauubos din yun kasi pupunta na naman tayo sa mga drug stores. So sabi na anong gawin, sir? Sabi ko, you need to protect the stand economy 
uh, uh, a sub program of the Peace 911 um, it will we will implement hopefully the program na tinatawag natin na seven peace the protection of standing mother trees the propagation of seedlings done by the surrenderers the rebel attorneys and other um, I, uh, sectors women sector ng ano ng uh, yung women groups ng uh, IPs and the propagation and the plantation of uh, of of cinnamon in uh, denuded areas kasi malawak talaga yung denuded areas sa Pakibato and then the, the processing which sabi ko kung pwede lang doon talaga ang machine sa community hindi yung bark lang yung o twigs lang ano yung leaves lang yung i-harvest and then ibenta sa siyudad na at the mercy sila sa fresh sa ano ng price sa uh, sino mag-set ng price dito sa sa baba sa siyudad ang ang proposal ko doon sa sa processing is kung pwede kung sana sana lang no na doon sa bundok so that the community will fully benefit uh, receive the benefit out of this uh, uh, tree na, na endemic sa kanila, abundant sa kanila. And then processing, uh, promotion, packaging, and then of course the, the practice of every home, yung sinasabi ni Ma'am November na if every home no, sa Pilipinas mayroong cinnamon, it will help the IPs have income out of this program, it can, uh, livelihood program, na siguro baka makatulong na kung economically well off sila because of the of the of the benefit of this cinnamon siguro it is our it's a it's a way of helping reduce the 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 ano the insurgency again no kasi kasi mayroon tayong program na ba surrender yung mga mga re rebels mga NPAs but kung hindi natin ma-sustain ito by uh, maximizing or harnessing the the what they have like cinnamon baka it will create conflict at saka ito na namang tinatawag natin na elite capture yung sinasabi ni Ma'am Irene Santiago by the way Ma'am Irene Santiago is the former uh, uh, chairperson of the GRP MLF pa panel na no? implementing panel so siya ngayon yung peace advisor ni Mayor Sara Duterte sa Pakibato na in the matter of nine months according to the the armed forces of the Philippines na clear yung area from the 40 years of insurgency no so ang gan ang ganda ng peace 911 but we really need to push cinnamon because it is this is the kind of tree that is abundant in the area and we should um, implement this program asap because this is the only way that they can feel that they can they can have benefit on the bounty of their of the resources, no, at itong cinnamon. So, hopefully, this uh, forum or this uh, meeting will inform everyone on the value of cinnamon, not on the perspective of magkakapera ba tayo, magkakabusiness ba tayo, but I would challenge everyone to, 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 to focus on how this tree can help reduce the insurgency in the country. Because poverty can just be a symptom of a deeper problem, which is, which is inequality. Okay? So, cinnamon, wag natin siyang tingnan na parang pineapple na, oh, magkakapira tayo, lahat ng pera from Europe comes into the Philippines. Oh, bantay tayo dyan. Because it will create conflict, because elite capture na naman, sino lang ang may alam, ang may control. At sino ang may control, yun din yung hingian ng revolutionary tax later on. Okay? So, th thank you. Thank you so much, Sir Jojo. I agree with what you say. Um, all these efforts are mm. honestly to promote um, education and awareness to everyone. So, before we end this session, yes, yes. I would like to invite everyone to join us on our next event. So, that's going to be on September 4th. Um, we're going to be, for those who are interested to learn more about essential oils, um, we have our first free E0101 for everyone. Um, this, this is going to be hosted by... Wait, I will try to share my screen. Okay. So this is going to be hosted by certified professional aromatherapist Lourdes Caballero. 
Um, so for anyone who's interested to learn more about essential oils, you can join that. The registration link is already live through our Instagram. So just click the link on our Instagram bio at Alliance of the Philippine Aromatherapist or um, check our Facebook um, group. So that's all for today. Thank you so much again, everyone, for joining. Before we end the session, please turn on your video so we can all have a group picture. And uh, alam kong busy si Dr. Doronila. Meron pa siyang meeting mamaya, alam ko. <laughs> so we have to Derby? do this quick, everyone. Yes. Jerby, may I just make an announcement? It seems that uh, yes. malalim yung uh, discussion on the Philippine Cinnamon kasi it spans the area of uh, ecology, of uh, poverty, and uh, commerce. No, So uh, we will uh, make another event uh, with Plantsville Health. And then uh, invite ko then of course yung mga aromatherapists. Uh, we can for aromatherapists, no. When you plant your own Philippine cinnamon, you just do two of just five leaves with your other leaves. It's already aromatherapy, ba? So let's uh, no, let's claim our rightful uh, inheritance of the Philippine cinnamon. Kalingag. Kalingag, yes. <laughs> I agree. Uh. Miss ano, Miss November, share mo na sa amin yung mga seedlings dahil magpo-plant na kami. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so turn on your videos everyone. Let's just take a quick group picture before we end this session. Okay? Okay na everyone? We have 30 plus here. I can only see 5, 10, 15, 20. 25 pa lang ito. Okay. <laughs> 1 Kung ayun no iba na hinihiyan. Great. 1 Sino pa? Okay, great. Sige, go. Turn on your videos. Alright, so one, two, three, smile. One more kasi dalawang page siya. Hindi na kasha sa isa. Okay, one, two, three, smile. Okay. Jerby, pwedeng mag- Yes? May isa last na lang. I would just like to thank uh, Dr. Doranila very much. Uh, for uh, for time, no. Uh, Doctor Doronila has been uh, studying how to restore uh, the new dead uh, areas, no, that were affected by mines, oh. and he is kindly helping Plantsville me without fee uh, for the yes. Philippine cinnamon. You know, <laughs> there's a lot to be known f about the Philippine cinnamon, and I'm a social entrepreneur. I have uh, very little science background. And his inputs to Philippines cinema and to all of us. Uh, and he is very generous in offering his knowledge. He is even offering his email address. So let's take this opportunity to get so much more information about the Philippine cinema. But please plant your own Philippine cinema. Uh, if you buy from us, I'd be very happy. But the first thing you have to look is yes. check if you also have cinema in your locality. Uh, it's good to plant that. If you cannot find it, plant the most common, which is the cinnamon yes. mercador, Very because good. it uh, um, appears all More over the city, so that's a mm -hmm. safe, uh, safe cinnamon to to preserve. Ayan. So I know a lot uh, of you have Derby. I also would like to do a shout out for Doctor yes. Belay Agoosh. Uh, Doctor Belay is uh, Maribel. Uh, Ago, she's the vice chair of uh, biology department of De La Salle University. I went to her place uh, two years ago and uh, she and Dr. Picardal have been helping me, guiding me in terms of uh, taxonomy on the Philippine cinnamon. So they're very generous people and I thank them with the, from the bottom of my heart for all of their support and of course you jerby for uh, bringing the philippine cinnamon in the space of aromatherapy among the enthusiasts in the philippines thank you very much thank you so much you. sir dr Daranila, any last few words i think uh, it's it's wonderful to meet all of you and uh, you know we we value our home so you know the cinnamon is part of our home in the philippines so maraming salamat sa inyo lahat Thank you so much, Po. And I look forward talaga to see the Philippine cinnamon or Kalingag grow as the years come. So thank you so much, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today. And we will post the replay on YouTube so that it's shareable and you can, you know, go back to the le lectures. So thank you so much, everyone who, everyone who chimed in. Thank you, sir. And goodbye. Happy Sunday. Bye. Thank you.